So glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. Welcome, everybody. Good morning.
Isaiah 61 and verse 1 says that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Today we're going to be starting a new series where we're going to, today's sermon is going to be titled, I'm Included. And I think that being included and being a part of something is just a desire that we all have, but it also is something that goes contrary to the law of sin, because sin is something that separates us from God. But God is saying that the good news is that the whole reason Jesus came was to take that which was separated and unite it, to take that which was broken and heal it, um, to take that which was in in bondage and release it and that all it comes about and we can be a part of the family of God and we can be um, included with God because of what Jesus did on the cross
Good morning. So for this morning's communion thought, uh, there was a debate that came to mind. It's fairly important. Uh, Marvel or DC? These are comic books and superheroes. Which one is better, right? If you're a Disney fan, it's a no-brainer. Marvel has raked in so much money. It's set records with the number of records that it's set. Um, the most recent movie, the big combined one, I should say, Avengers Endgame, made more than any other movie in history, 2.79 billion with, with a B dollars. That's a lot of money. All told, 27 movies have made Disney 22 billion worldwide. So you know who made the list of the top 10 superhero movies to, in terms of making, mo making money? So there's Marvel, Marvel, Marvel. And then of the DC Comics, I'm sure you would guess Aquaman. <laughs> He's in the top 10, right? Everyone thinks of Batman as Superman when talking about superheroes. And we, we love to joke about who's best, right? We, we do it with sports teams. We do it with which high school or if you went to college, which college you went to. We do it on terms of sodas, whether it's Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper. We love to rank uh, each other. When we start to compare ourselves to each other, when we start to compare each other to one another, um, we create a hierarchy and we tread on dangerous territory. This is something the Corinthians had taken to new levels. They had people called super apostles. I mean, that sounds pretty cool. I imagine their superpower being they could be martyred multiple times before they're finally brought to resurrection and glory. I, I joke. Um, Paul cuts right to it in 2 Corinthians 11 about what a super apostle is in reference to God. It also shows up in the divisions in 1 Corinthians 11. So in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 19, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your, meeting, your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Let's stop here. Imagine... Paul, someone who helped start the church in Corinth, coming back and saying, the worship you're doing on, on Sunday has no purpose. In fact, it's doing more harm than good. Right? He has similar verse, verbiage in Galatians 2, verse 6. As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. So Paul is hitting them hard with this. They're showing favoritism. They've got super apostles. They've got classes and distinguishing groups in the church. And Paul's not kind about pointing it out. Imagine being told that the Lord's Supper you think you're taking is not actually communion. So in verse 20, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, or this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The idea is not that we should lower how we treat those with respect, or who have walked ahead of us, who, who have earned some trust with us, the idea is that we need to raise up those that are being overlooked. That there's not a super apostle and then regular apostles. They're apostles. They're saints in Christ, and all are saints in Christ. Remember that Christ died while we, yes, all of us, were still sinners. And he did this 
when we, again, all of us, were undeserving. Being equal with God, he lowered himself down to a servant, obedient to death on a cross. How often are we willing to pick up and carry a cross for those we respect or esteem, for the superheroes around us, the super apostles? How often do we consider becoming a servant for those around us who have nothing? Do we honestly value others about our, above ourselves? Reflect on these things as we get ready for communion. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for that sacrifice on the cross, the, the greatest of gifts when we were not ready, when we weren't willing, when we were still in our evil and sin. Thank you for the, the body that was broken, the blood that was shed to wash us white, clean and new. Let us take of the bread that represents that body. Let us take of the cup that represents the blood. And remember the sacrifice on the cross that washes us clean and brings us closer to you and closer to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, the sacrifice you made for us, and we just help 
help us to be more like you and forgive us where we failed you. Uh, just hope, uh, please bless the tithes and offerings that were uh, provided this morning, and I uh, just pray that the church can use that wisely, and that'll be a blessing to the community here. And just uh, view the messages this morning, and I uh, pray that it'll be a blessing to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to see everybody this morning. Just a few announcements. Tomorrow, small groups begin. So if you haven't signed up yet, um, now's your chance. And here they are, Monday night with Jim at Caleb and Diane's. Is it 6 or 6.30? 6.30. So ignore the 6 o'clock there. Unless you're always late, then it's 6 o'clock. On Tuesday night with Antonio at Bill and Justine's at 6.30, um, if you haven't signed up. And there's been a location change for this one. Uh, the leader is still Justin, but it's going to be at Stephanie and John's. So if you signed up for that one, just make a note that you're in a different place, not here. Walk to Life is coming up soon, so if you'd like to be a part of that, um, see Alexis. She'll give you any details that you would like. Kids group is Thursday, 930 at Justine's house. So if you want to be a part of that. Today we have a business meeting um, after services at 1230. We're still collecting for the church in Cuba. Um, so they're trying to buy a house to meet in there. So if you would like to uh, help out with it that just put it in the box with a note on it or put it in an envelope or something like that the book club is returning this friday night at our house so well, friday the 13th at six o'clock so if you've read the books uh, through this summer um, it'll be at our house six o'clock youth retreat planning meeting is next sunday after services so if you'd like to be a part of that um, show up our family of the week this week is Gloria, so keep Gloria in your prayers. Uh, and She's here, so you can check with her and see if there's anything special that she needs prayer for. Some upcoming events, see you at the poll, is this month, the 25th. The Cider Fest, Fest is coming up the 27th, and the Walk for Life fundraiser the 28th. If you would like more information, more details, check the bulletin or the newsletter um, and they have more information. Kids Church this week, if you have someone between the ages of two and five you'd like to send to Kids Church, Katie and RJ will take them now. Good morning, church. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Um, if you would, open your Bibles with me and turn to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Not quite all the way back to the very beginning, but pretty close. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read the first 11 verses there of Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. <clears throat> now, the servant was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said... You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. <clears throat> and the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. But God called out to the man and said, Where are you? Adam answered, I was... I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the, woman, and the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So this is what is referred to as the fall of man, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden and um, sin entering into the world and the account of when the first humans, Adam and Eve, first disobeyed God. And we're in the midst of football season. If you know me very much at all, then you know that I love sports and of all the sports that are out there, I like college football the most. There's nothing that quite gets my blood pumping from a competitive standpoint like college football. And <clears throat> I think one of the reasons why I like college football is because of the team aspect of college football. You can have a superstar, you can have somebody who is really, really good, and that can carry some, a team a long ways. But how many times have you seen an absolute star that just gets humiliated when somebody game plans just for that one player? Or how many times have you seen a player forget that he's a part of a team and he just kind of goes out there all on his own? And sometimes it can work a little bit, but most of the time, team ends up winning out over I. The old saying is that there's no I in team, right? And so to win and to win at the highest level in college football, you have to be a team. Well, in our biblical account here that we just read in Genesis chapter 3, we see Adam and Eve, the first humans that God made, being a part of God's team. The inference here is that God was used to coming down in the cool of the day and walking and talking with Adam and Eve in the garden. They had a relationship, they had a a bond, a connection that was obviously strong and obviously something that they enjoyed and that he enjoyed. But when sin entered into the world it damaged that relationship. This relationship that God had with Adam and Eve, He had put conditions on. He had put boundaries and He had told them, when you think about it, it's pretty simple. And in some ways, it would be a lot simpler to go back to where we only had one instruction. But if there's anything that I've learned about human nature, and you've probably learned too if, you're, if you've thought about it very much. When we've put a single thing out there, don't touch the stove. What is almost automatic with our kids when we say, don't touch the stove? They want to go touch it, or um, don't taste this, or don't eat this, or don't look over there, or whatever. Um, we, we tend to do that. And so God had put one condition on Adam and Eve. And he said, if you disobey, it's going to damage this relationship. Your status on the team will change if you disobey. We're kicking off a new sermon series that we've titled, I'm In. And we're going to look at several in statements. And we're going to start off today by talking about, I'm included. I'm included. 
What does it mean to be included? After announcing the curses to Adam and to Eve and to the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, we get to the end of the chapter and God says this. After Adam and Eve had sinned, again, this is what we refer to as the fall of man, verse 24 says, God drove out the man At the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1 that therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Sin came into the world through one man, through Adam, through this account that we just read, that we refer to as the fall. This is how sin entered into the world. And so, you might say that Adam and Eve separated humans from God by their sin, and humans have been trying to get back into relationship with God ever since. You could also say that God has been trying to get into relationship with humans ever since. If you carry out the team analogy, God kicked Adam and Eve off of their team, God kicked humans off of his team, and has been spending his time, has devised a plan so that humans, you and me, can get back on the team. Further, I believe that God placed inside each one of us a desire to be on God's team. There's, there's something that drives us to want to be a part of something bigger, to want to understand more, and to want to know who God is. And so we long for, we strive for being a part of something bigger. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and this is a fairly familiar passage of scripture, a parable that if I say parable of the talents, you're going to say, oh yeah, 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 no, no, I know that one. But we're going to read it anyway. Matthew 25, starting in verse number 14, <clears throat> Jesus here teaching, and he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey. He will call his servants and entrust to them his property. To one of the servants he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability, and then he went away. The one who had received five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also the one who had two talents made two talents more. But the one who received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more, and said, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also, the one who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who had received the one talent also came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered, You wicked and slothful servant, You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I could have received what was my own with interest. 
So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, into a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus here says that the kingdom of heaven will be like a team of people, a group of employees, a master who had a group that he was leaving, and so he calls this group of people to him, and he delivers to them talents. The coach, if you will, gave the team instructions and the ones who don't follow those instructions will be kicked off the team. Now, there's some things that we need to realize and there's some things that we need to point out that come to light as a result of this teaching, as a result of this parable. The first thing goes along with, with what uh, we were talking about in Sunday school today as far as... Um, just the, the emotional connection that we can have to Scripture, the way that we have experienced religion, the way that we have experienced God, is going to shape the way that we view God. And so our emotions can sometimes override truth and lead us in a direction that's not necessarily true. So you could read this and you could say, that's a, that's a harsh master. I mean, he, who knows why the guy didn't, maybe, uh, maybe he hadn't understood that masters could have grace. Maybe he didn't understand about interest. Maybe he had never been taught. Maybe he, maybe he, maybe he. And so think about how harsh God or the master could be. But the first truth that we need to realize is that God wanted every member of the team. God wants every member of the team. Have you ever heard somebody say, why would a loving God send somebody to hell? If you want to get really, really, really technical about it, yes, He will be the judge that will send somebody, but God doesn't send people to hell. We choose. Hell is a consequence of our choices. As we said, in the beginning, when the fall happened, when sin entered into the world, it created a division. It fractured the relationship between humans and God. But God has put out there and made it very plain the plan for us to be back into relationship with God. That's because God wants everybody on the team. 2 uh, Peter says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the first thing that we need to realize is that God wants every member of the team. Number two, we need to realize that every member of the team belonged. Sometimes it's, <clears throat> it's easy for us in our human minds, we, we hear this teaching, we hear this parable, and we're like, well, there's, there's classes in the church. Some people are more valuable, some people aren't as valuable. We need to understand the truth is everyone is on the team. Everyone belongs on the team. Everyone God wanted on the team. God wasn't looking at the one talent person differently than he was working, looking at the ten talent person other than that one had more responsibility. It didn't have anything to do with value. It had to do with ability. Go back and look. He said, according, he gave each one of them talents, each one what? According to his ability. The third thing that we need to realize is that every member of the team had a talent. God didn't kick anybody out there with no talent. He gave everyone a talent. 
The last thing, then there's a lot more that we can learn from this, but this is just in connection to what we're wanting to talk about this morning. The last thing that I want us to realize is that not being on the team is a sad place to be. Not being a part of the team is not a desirable result. Now, when we read verse number 30 that says, Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, into that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, what is the first thing we think of? Hell, eternal punishment. Because that's how hell is described in multiple locations, in different places. And so we're, we're, we're drawing this obvious eternal application to this teaching because Jesus uses terminology that is used to describe hell. And so it's punishment. It's not only punishment, it's eternal punishment. And so let me ask this question. Is hell a punishment because of the pain and torment or is being off of the team such a punishment that he describes hell in this way because there's a difference if you go to the account when Jesus is on the cross and we we can tie the, the the context doesn't completely just spell everything out the way that I'm getting ready to, to talk about it but you tie different scriptures together and you can arrive at this place we know that when Jesus is crucified that he took your sin and my sin upon him right we know that he cried out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? We know that the Bible says that he went into Hades, into the, the abode of the dead. And some of your translations will say he went to hell. I believe that Jesus experienced hell as a part of the punishment, as a part of paying the price for you and for me. And part of that hell wasn't the fact that he went to this place that is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and fire and brimstone and the... the um, everlasting fire, and all of the different things that hell is described at, as, I believe that the hell, the biggest punishment of hell was the fact that because of your sin and because of my sin, the relationship with God that he had since the beginning was fractured. He had never experienced that separation. And because of your sin and because of my sin, he did. And so, the pain and torment, it may feel like a fire, it may be like burning. I'm not so sure that it's a literal place as much as it is an absence of relationship with God. Now, the Bible describes it as that, so we have to take the Bible at His word. I think that part of that is trying to describe it in ways that we can understand as a human. But I believe the biggest part of hell the biggest punishment of hell is the fact that Jesus is not going to be there. God's not going to be there. 
And so I, I believe being separated from God and being separated from God's team is so painful that Jesus describes it as weeping and gnashing of teeth. Johnny had had a hard life growing up. Things were not easy for him. It started the time of his birth. He was unfortunately born with some tumors on his brain and on his neck that needed to be operated on immediately. While the surgeries were successful, the surgeries took a heavy toll on his body. The surgeries damaged his fine motor skills and affected his cognitive abilities. Even walking was difficult for Johnny. As a result of the surgeries and the fact that his cognitive abilities and his fine motor skills were damaged, it was really hard for Johnny to fit in. It was hard for Johnny to make friends. It was common for him to be left out at recess, for him to not be invited to birthday parties. And Johnny became a frequent target of those who wanted to pick on someone. Johnny knew what it was like to be left out. He knew what it was like to be alone, to be forgotten, and to be unloved by others. I just picked a random name. This is not really a true story. This is just something that was made up. But even hearing that, we can relate can't we? We can identify with Johnny. We can envision what it would be like to be Johnny. What, it would, what, what Johnny might look like. And maybe you can put a face on Johnny because you've seen Johnny in your school or in your neighborhood. Those are never easy things to feel or to experience. There's a thing that's been happening for years, and the term that I think is the proper term to describe it now is hazing. Hazing. Where a person or persons wants to be a part of a group, and so they have tasks that they have to perform in order to gain entry into this group. For example, in 2015, a Dartmouth College fraternity had a criminal investigation opened up into their hazing practices after they reportedly forced pledgers to chug cups filled with vinegar, swim in kiddie pools that they had filled with rotten food, vomit, and other bodily fluids, and had forced them to eat omelets made from vomit. Now, I understand a criminal investigation, but in order for there to be a criminal investigation, there had to be somebody who wanted to be in this fraternity bad enough that they were willing to do all of those things that this fraternity was making them to do. You might be like me, and you hear that, and you think, now what? Why? But if you stop for just a minute, you know exactly why. Because if you've, if you've got a heartbeat and brain activity, you know what it's like to be a part of something. You know what it's like to not be a part of something. You know what it's like to want to be a part. People want to be included. People want to be a part of the team. And the desire to be a part of something will drive people to do absolutely crazy things.
God created that desire. God created us to want to be a part of something bigger. And when sin entered into the world, the ultimate place for us to be as humans is to be in relationship with God. And when sin comes into our life, it damages that. It separates us from God. And that's the whole reason why Jesus had to come was so that he could pay the price to allow us back on the team. Now there's benefits to being a part of a team. And we want to talk about that briefly as we put together a brief acrostic for team. T stands for testimony. When you think about being a part of a spiritual team like the church, it helps to know you're not alone. It helps to have the testimony of other people. It helps to have the experiences of other people shared with you so that you know, whether you're talking about relationships, whether you're talking about um, finance, whether you're talking about work, whatever. I mean, so Phil was mentioning the fact that on Thursday morning we have a mom's group. What's part of the allure, what's part of the draw of having a mom's group? Because moms have experiences that are special connected to motherhood. Sorry, guys, but we have a really hard time understanding what it's like to be a mom. And so they can talk to us all day long. We can be as understanding and compassionate as we can possibly be, and we're still not going to really understand what it's like to be a mom. And so a new mom, hearing the testimony of moms with experience, can be helpful. First-time moms, where they're going through something for the first time, if they talk to a mom who's had three or four of them, and they lived, the older mom can say, you know what, this will pass. They're, they'll make it through. <laughs> You'll make it through. <laughs> I know you're not sleeping at all, and I know you're exhausted every morning, and I know, and I know, and I know, but guess what, you will make it. And it helps to know that you're not the only one that's experiencing this, doesn't it? The testimony of other people. There's a strength that comes from knowing others are fighting the same battles that we are. Jesus said in John chapter 13, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You know, one of the ways that we can love each other is through testimony. One of the benefits of having a team is testimony. Again, go back to sports. My favorite college team is the Oklahoma Sooners, and we're fortunate enough to have one of the brightest young coaches in all of football right now. Um, whether it's college or pro or whatever, people are coming and talking to him about how to do offense and how to do all of this stuff. And so... They've got a new quarterback this year who came from Alabama, which is a pretty successful college program. And it's interesting to hear the conversation because he transferred in like January, I think. And so um, the last several quarterbacks that, that Lincoln Riley has had, he's had years in the system before they started playing. Jalen Hurts is the first one who he's only had a few months. And so he was talking about, Jalen Hurts was talking about trusting the system because he had never seen how what Lincoln Riley was teaching him would play out in a game. I mean, he hadn't even got hit in practice because quarterbacks aren't allowed to be tackled. And so he didn't even know what it was going to be like to try to run this offense. And so he's like, I have to trust the way that, it, that it's, it's going to go.
one of the things with a team is there has to be a trust level there of this action is going to result in this consequence. And God tells us, the way that people will know you are my disciples is if you have love for one another. One of the benefits to having a team is to have the testimonies of the other team members. One of the ways that we love each other is to share the experiences that we've had. One of the ways that, that I can care about you is to share and to, to let you know that the battles that you're facing, you're not facing these alone. Some of the things that you're, you may be going through, you're not going through alone. I can tell you it's lonely when you're struggling with a sin and you feel like you're the only one in church that has a sin problem. And I'm not saying that we glorify sin, but if we sit there and we hide all of the things that, that we struggle with and I'm here struggling and I'm here thinking that I don't have um, anybody to talk to because I'm the only one that's got this problem and you're sitting there thinking... You're the only one that's facing sin, and you're the only one that has a sin problem, and we're putting off this aura that we're perfect. We're both going to be hopeless together, but not know it. We're both going to be struggling together and not know it. John tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. Can this passage of Scripture have love for one another and brokenness? Can that fit together? It can. And it can be a benefit and it can be a strength to the team because the testimonies of the other team members build the team. Secondly, the E stands for encouragement. When we share those experiences, when we love each other in that way, it's an encouragement. I have never seen where opening up and sharing and being broken together is a discouraging result. It's always a strengthening result. Now, if you want to tear people down by learning what they share and then beating them over the head with it, that can be discouraging. But that's not what I'm talking about. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to the one who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two can withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. The bottom line is that we need each other. We can be an encouragement to each other. When we are team members that come together that are a team, not a whole bunch of individuals. I talked about in the beginning, you can have that one superstar who's out there all by himself, but what usually ends up happening to that guy? He usually ends up crashing and burning. We need each other. And we need each other to truly know and understand us. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. 
And we encourage you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. We're talking about the benefits of team. When we're thinking about being an encouragement, when we're thinking about the team being an encouragement, you can't forget about the leaders. Don't forget about the team leaders. Don't forget about the ones who are organizing. Don't forget about the ones who are leading. Don't forget about the ones who are teaching. We, they need to be encouraged as well. Don't forget about the ones who are working. Don't forget about the ones who are doing stuff. They need encouragement as well. Don't forget about the ones who don't really feel like they're a part of the team. Don't forget about the ones who, he says, admonish the idle. Why are they idle? Maybe they don't think they can. Maybe they don't think they belong. Maybe they've had somebody in the past who has squashed them. Maybe they haven't had the freedom to go ahead and do something. Maybe they've tried to do something in the past and got shot down. Encourage the faint-hearted. <laughs> um, so it was about two years ago that I thought I wanted to start working out and get in better shape and it wasn't that I ever wanted to be like a bodybuilder or anything like that. I just wanted to do stuff without like getting lightheaded and you know I, I just wanted to be able to run. Well the very the very first time that we did anything of consequence as far as working out ha have you heard of the dry heaves? Where you're Th trying to throw your body's trying to throw up but you, there's nothing to throw up so we're working out in the morning and I didn't eat before we went and evidently my digestive system was working properly because it was empty and um, you might say that I got faint-hearted and I threw up nothing and I laid there and I don't know, it felt like forever. It was probably, what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. <clears throat> it would have been understandable for me to say, this is not fun. This is not what I had in mind when I said I wanted to start to work out and just quit. I don't need this. I don't want this, and I don't know. There is something humiliating about having to say, do you know where the trash can is? Because there's other people. I mean, there's people on the treadmills. There's other people working out, and I don't want to just all over. I didn't know what was going to come up or not come up. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. Now in the context, he's talked about leaders. He's talked about faint-hearted. He's talked about weak. He's talked about idle. Does that pretty much cover the team? I mean, that's pretty much covers the team. We need to be patient with each other. Encourage each other for the good of the team. A stands for action. Being a part of a team is about doing something. We want to accomplish things. You can do nothing all by yourself. You can accomplish nothing all by yourself. 
But there's a, there's a different level of satisfaction when as a group, as a team, we accomplish something and we accomplish more than what we would be able to accomplish by ourselves. Being a part of a team <clears throat> is about doing something. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, Keep loving one another earnestly. Above all, he says, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. I think I said earlier that it was John, it was Peter that said that, obviously. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace Whoever speaks is the one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter says you need to love the team. You need to share with the team. It's one of the blessings, I feel like, of small groups is you get to interact on a much more personal level than here on Sunday morning. You're sharing experiences. You're sharing um, struggles and different things. You're sharing food. You're sharing someone's home. You're sharing all of these different things. And... He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I mean, if you've hosted small groups, yeah, it's a benefit, and yeah, we enjoy it, and yeah, but there's times that it's work. There's times it's inconvenient. But is it worth it? Verse 10, it's interesting to me. He doesn't say, if one receives a gift, use it. What's he say? As you receive a gift, use it. Go back to the parable of the talents. Did they all get a talent? Did they all receive a blessing? They all did. Nobody was not on the team, and nobody was not valued by the master. What's your talent? Put it into action. Use it. Realize you have a gift that will bless the team. Use it. Act with it. We also need to realize that God is the one who has blessed us with that talent. God is the one who has blessed us with the strength to be able to uh, help the team. And so we need to do all of these things, speaking or serving or whatever, in order that God is the one who receives the glory. The glory doesn't go to us. The glory goes to God. And so M stands for matters. The team matters. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church so that he might sanctify her and cleanse her. Yes, this is a message to husbands, but don't miss the larger principle about the team. The team mattered enough that Christ died for it. The team mattered enough that He gave the team to Himself. The team mattered enough to Him that He keeps working with the team and keeps cleansing the team and keeps washing the team. The team 
the church is important. You belong on the team. You belong to the team. You need the team. The team needs you. And that's why it's vital that each of us are a part. The band can come. We all want to be included. We all want to be a part of a team. Sin separates us from the team leader. Sin separates us from other members of the team. As we think about being left off of the team, it's not a pretty picture. When, when you hear Jesus describing punishment, it's not something that we're listening to that and going, oh yeah, sign me up for that. We all want to be included. We all want to be a part. And the reality is God wants us to be a part. And so if you're not a part of the team, I would ask why. If you don't feel like you're a part of the team, I would ask why. Have you made everyone feel included? Do you feel included? Sin will come in and sin will make us feel like we're not a part. Jesus looks at you, Jesus looks at me and he says, I love you, I want you to be a part Come join my team. I want you. You belong on my team. Let's all be standing. Father in heaven, God, we, we realize that we are sinners. We realize that we are broken, and we realize that sin does separate us from you but we're thankful that you have provided a way for sin to be overcome, for our relationship with you to be restored, and for us to be in fellowship with you and with each other. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for, for providing redemption and salvation. Thank you for, for providing a team for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.